I don't have a real version of Windows, so Arr, I'm a pirate. <laughs>What is it that makes a man a man? In June of 1997, a self-help book entitled The Way of the Superior Man was issued by David Dita. That same year, a kid in England was born into a working-class family of Pakistani immigrants, a father who worked late nights as a cab driver and a mother who took care of the home and the several children within it. Dita's book will come as my guidance for the making of this video, which I've delayed considerably when I should have been delaying gratification instead. Way of the Superior Man rests is more than just a self-help manual. Today, it has been renowned in many circles as a sort of masculine bible for intimacy and spiritual growth, sorely needed by young men, but rarely talked about among them. The Pakistani kid I just mentioned took a particular liking to this book, which he surely read fitted in a sweaty bathrobe. This handbook is crammed with critical information regarding masculine growth, and modern society, complete with distractions like TikTok, Instagram, and OnlyFans, seem to obscure. Online personalities such as Andrew and Tristan Tate seem to have made much of their following revealing the extent of such diversions, and because of how provocative of a sociological topic this is, it is now apparent that men have formed groups around these individuals in a quest for salvation, in spite of the social drawbacks. Tate's arrest and Romanian's accusations of trafficking do not diverge from the fact that to many men, Andrew Tate was a symbol of liberation. Dita expands on the sentiments such movements grow on in his book. Two hours of absorption in the good Super Bowl telecast may distract you temporarily, but the fact remains. You're born as a sacrifice, and you can either participate in the sacrifice, dissolving in the giving of your gift, or you can resist it, which is your suffering. But there's a new movement on the rise, and the mass media would have you believe it is a demonstration in favor of misogyny, of animosity, reprimand, and ignorance. But as you, a young man, sit comfortably in your first world living room couch and watch demagogues parade a message of do what feels good on television, a haunting thought catches you. Are these not the same people who told you that body positivity meant staying out of shape was acceptable? Are the companies that fund newscasts trustworthy? Their owners seem to have an interest in you eating advertised junk food from mass chain restaurants after all, if we can even call them restaurants. Can you trust a memo from a company which would rather you take pharmaceuticals than a walk in the sunlight to absorb the world's divine glory? A haunting aura surrounds you, a rebel to the postmodern world, the only man in 10 miles radius, seemingly abstaining from indulgence and pleasure to seek purpose instead. And the internet is a scary place, a mass web of information feeding off instinct through feeding into your addictions like pornography. But just as the unprecedented revolution in interconnection can ruin you, it may also change your life for the better, that is, if you seek out the right mentors. There is no man that knows this better than Sam Harbone. That's right, baby, we're doing a full fucking 360 this time. No angle of this story left uncovered. I've been bodybuilding for five years. I'd say that I'm in pretty good shape. Hamza's YouTube channel, the main subject of this short documentary, has experienced this spur in new subscribers. In just a couple weeks after reaching a million viewers, the channel climbed all the way up to a million and a half, with an average growth of several thousand per day. To understand the reason for Hamza's sudden growth and following, one does not need to look for much further than authenticity. It becomes clear from the very first video that you see that the man you are watching, whether in a bathrobe, at his living room table, or parents' home, has no intention of hiding anything from you. In his first videos, Hamza describes his dissatisfaction with the state of a subcategory of YouTube known as the self-improvement genre, or back then, the self-help genre. A lot of the creators who first sought the same audience as Hamza, that is, young men dissatisfied with the side effects and implications of modernity, did it in a sneaky way. These YouTubers are what Hamza would later refer to as clean-shirted video creators. Without naming specific examples, one cannot deny that there are plenty of YouTube channels with hosts that fit this description. Short hair, wearing a tie, outwardly professional and trying to remain as uncontroversial and apart from the mainstream as possible. It was clear to Hamza very early on that he had little chance of growing in a community like this. 
Determined by the idea that he could help young men while still being open about his own shortcomings and awkward past, and even use the two in conjunction with one another to create a spiraling effect that would grow his channel, Hamza set to work. His early videos appeared more experimental than they were concise. Hamza's first entrepreneurial endeavors were not, after all, in the self-improvement or even self-help genre of YouTube. As he would later go on to describe in many videos, young Hamza had just recently finished college and found himself in search of a job, although soon realizing that his degree meant little in the working world. Determined to become what is commonly referred to as a digital nomad, by becoming location independent, Hamza began reading books on finance, starting out with Tim Ferriss' 4-hour workweek and MJ DeMarco's Millionaire Fastlane. Taking out the lesson that content creation was more beneficial for passive income than trading time for money at a company, the aspiring entrepreneur was first motivated to become a rapper, before realizing the difficulties of online fame. In between working days, Hamza described in his videos how he set his sights on reselling, dropshipping, and e-commerce in general as a way to fund his numerous ventures. With the little money he made here, Hamza found himself in a much better position to afford video equipment to film his videos, and often reached out in search of tactics utilized by other, at the time far bigger content creators like Alex Becker and Iman Gatsi. Hamza's first YouTube channel, Mage PvP, uploaded Minecraft content in the early 2010s, and he managed this venture as a teenager from his parents' home, never being able to accumulate much of an audience among the large amount of gaming channels that emerged during the same period. Still, as he would later go on to admit, it would allow him to better understand how to write video titles and use tags to his advantage. With his several videos, telling stories from his university days of clubbing and partying, he gave viewers the impression of being a fairly extroverted individual. He opened up as well about his earlier life living alone with his parents, and difficulties young men face, particularly throughout school and with girls. The new channel, titled as his first name, began with Hamza opening up about his past, a trend that he would later set for his later projects. He made an effort to share these early videos across Reddit, and later two major platforms, Discord and Instagram, although the first, as well as the latter, would not be utilized seriously until much later. Right. Hey guys, Mage PvP here, back with another MC PvP Hunger Games video. <laughs> it's Sunday, uh, the 3rd or 4th, it's one of those. I have work tomorrow, another full day shift as normal, Monday to Friday. I'm gonna quit. I'm either going to go in and quit or I'm going to go in and ask to be changed to part-time. Now, I've done the maths behind this. I'm on £17,500 right now, which is quite low. It's kind of normal for an entry-level job, £8.41 an hour, so it's about 10% over minimum wage. So it's okay. I am a graduate, but I just fucked around through uni. I only passed with a third class honours, so it's not really, it doesn't really count that much. So I did the maths with... National insurance and with tax, the 17,500 goes to a, just under 15,000 a year for full-time wage. His first true entrepreneurial journey, however, came in the form of self-improvement coaching. Hamza's first YouTube subscribers came largely from his family in Pakistan, as well as online friends. But the small following gave him enough leeway to acquire new viewership from Reddit, as his videos became shared in several video communities by high-ranking accounts. Once this took its toll, he had enough credibility with several hours of content to begin building up an online business, in the form of charging Fiverr clients from 10 to 20 British pounds for an hour call, where Hamza could give them feedback on various areas of life, using a university degree in psychology to better understand their problems. By linking the two together, Hamza was cleverly able to direct his Fiverr clients towards becoming lawyer viewers of his channel, providing him with watch time and valuable criticism back, and was able to direct viewers of the videos towards his Fiverr account. It was at this time where we can assume the early Hamza, with his first few uploads, learned the importance of links in segmenting his videos. The first true video segmentation, according to my team's research and my own memory of these early Hamza videos throughout the 2021, came in the form of the unfiltered section. The unfiltered section later became its own full venture, Hamza Unfiltered, which would become its own full channel for long-form unedited videos, short clips, and later even live streams. This unfiltered channel is crucial in understanding the growth of the movement, as it provided an outlet for Hamza's more dedicated followers to give him feedback. As the main channel's videos would continue to become more focused on providing support to a mainstream audience, Hamza would continue his older style of content on this new channel. The original section idea provided a lot of the background for this. The idea of the unfiltered section, in Hamza's own words, was that after several minutes viewership, you would usually decline. Single mothers, old people, non-English speakers, and people with low attention spans, complete with all other persons who Hamza could not consider his target audience, would click off the video by then, and around 20% would be left watching around the halfway mark. 
At this point, Hamza would shed the clean shirt persona or the gimmick he would use to begin the video and start being more open with the viewers, keeping them engaged while reinforcing the entirely true idea that they were part of a minority group. The dedicated viewers of Hamza's several videos with unfiltered sections would later come onto the unfiltered channel linked on the main page. It is impossible to begin the next stage of Hamza's development as a content creator, at which he hit the thousand subscriber mark, without going into two separate occurrences. This isn't a dragged out 10 minutes and 15 second long video with a three minutes Dollar Shave Club advertisement in the middle. This is my practical guide for guys who want real advice from someone who's been through this journey. These are Hamza's idea to develop a course for bodybuilding as an alternative for his coaching clients, and a concept to create longer form content in general. These two ideas seem to brew in Hamza's mind long enough to end up as a project that combined both. The realistic, down-to-earth aesthetic body guide, which upon being shared to Reddit would accumulate massive traction. The watch time from other guys in the same bodybuilding journey Hamza had found himself rapidly succeeding in grew based on his previous approach. Hamza gave young men real information in the form of an extended, well-edited, and practical video guide that outlined all the basics in muscle building in places where it counts, using fat and balancing fitness and diet. YouTube recommendations soon propelled the video, significantly growing Hamza's viewer base to the point of doubling and tripling it over the run of several weeks and months, redirecting viewers to his older content and even coaching services. At this point, Hamza's financial literacy reading and determination towards entrepreneurial success for YouTube paid off, and the value of his time, in Hamza's own words, began to grow and increase. The growing YouTuber began to understand that the hold that he had on his audience was serious, unlike anything he had ever come to terms with before, in fact. He could no longer balance making longer form content with coaching calls, therefore beginning to gradually increase the prices of the coaching sessions as the amount of new clients increased, and reviews for the service remained wholly positive. By working part-time as a self-improvement coach and gearing these viewers towards the coaching calls, Hamza could spend his time working on developing an aesthetic body course that, when published, would contribute a large amount to his monthly income. Despite now making a business out of his audience, however, Hamza continued to be authentic. Although he stopped with unfiltered sections shortly after this with the creation of his Hamza Unfiltered channel, he never stopped being true to himself. Hamza would repeatedly remark throughout his videos that one of the main appeals of his channel, alike to large creators like Alex Hermosi, was to not push products onto viewers. It quickly became apparent to him that a lot of his audience were young men still enrolled in secondary education perhaps many who had never worked a job and could not pay for extra content like this. Hamza therefore reasoned that his coaching goals and aesthetic body course would simply be optional ways for his viewers to support him. Refusing to make paid content or to set up a Patreon or any outlet of that kind, which many creators at the time seemed to do. At the same time, he made sure that the money would be well spent. The weight of the new responsibility of thousands of men watching Hamza's videos all of a sudden made him more aware of his own bad habits. He could not preach the removal of quote-unquote instant gratification activities in favor of delaying gratification, if he himself did not stick by this exact message. As a wise man once said, a leader knows the way, shows the way, and goes the way. Seeking to become the definition of a leader or provider figure like this, Hamza faced the crisis of having to abandon many of his lazy, common habits and become a full-time content creator. Admittedly, this did have its benefits as he was no longer obliged to work a full-time job and would not need to dip into his savings in order to pay for his expenses, although still relatively cheap. His new life in the UK began shortly before then as he announced to his then tiny audience that he was going to take a gamble of his life by leaving the job he previously applied for and trying to become a full-time digital nomad. Now Hamza was well on his way to making this happen, and in the back of his mind began planning a goal for Far Ahead, the Thailand trip. Having read about Tim Ferriss' time in Argentina in the 4-hour work week, it seemed like a logical step. He knew well about the benefits of moving to more developed areas of third world countries, cheap food, digital workability, martial arts training, and minimal living expenses among them. And to him, they seemed appealing. The same seemed to be true for another content creator that Hamza would soon cross paths with, this being none other than Jack from the CEO of Testosterone. But again, this meant another turning point. Hamza would need to balance his coaching calls with the need to produce both long-form and short-form content, and would need to enter an experimental stage once again to see what worked and how to best keep his audience accumulated, excited for new content, without letting them drift to other parts of YouTube. Knowing that they had to be authentic already, Hamza now made full documents defining his core audience, studying their interest and situation, and seeing what aspect of his pre-existing personality and story would most appeal to them as a second point of interest. The viewership could not just freeze in place. Hamza had to use new and innovative ideas to keep his viewers entertained. In the words of MJ DeMarco, he had to outsource his workload to others. One could not be a digital nomad in the beautiful Thai tropical forests without first ensuring that others would be there to back him up. 
No businessman is a true businessman without a company, after all. The main benefit of outsourcing video labor was that Hamza already had set himself up in a well-to-do position where he could afford it. With YouTube monetization now enabled for his channel and his ventures now in the YouTube Partner Program, internet ad placements and YouTube Premium Revenue would add to money gained from one-to-one -one coaching calls and courses. These various ways of accumulating income, combined with prior savings from e-commerce and specific ventures like dropshipping and eBay selling, could allow Hamza to hire a full-time video editor now, which he took to Fiverr and Reddit in search for. The author MG DeMarco stressed the importance and cheap rates of virtual assistants and content editors in the early internet era, especially from other countries. What Hamza soon found, though, is that in order to work with someone properly in the long term, he would need to find someone with a similar background. He would need to not only find someone that was willing to work for him, but with him, to give him advice and guide him along his YouTube journey, just as surely as he would guide that man in his own self-improvement. It's perhaps by providence, then, that Hamza's path soon intertwined with none other than the previously mentioned Sam Harbone. In order to understand how good of a video editor Sam is, one first needs to understand how bad of a live streamer Sam was. Sorry, Sam. No matter just how average Sam's old content may seem, it only provides more context to this documentary. Never in a million years could somebody be making a full informational video about this man if he did not have the determination and self-transcendent will to alter his own circumstances. Luckily for Sam, aka Harbinator, this is the one thing that he could rely upon. From his very first content, signs of a man wanting to escape the trap of modernity could be seen. From a psychological perspective, if one cares to delve deeper into Sam's story, it quickly becomes apparent that Harbinator's personality greatly complemented the online image of Hamza. Whereas Hamza was more extroverted, Sam mostly kept to himself. Where Hamza saw possibility and innovation, Sam could consider the realistic ramifications of each decision. Where Hamza acted on the basis of his purpose and heart, Sam often retorted with analytical thinking, without falling into the traps of the mainstream. And more important than all three, Sam could see room for adaptation where Hamza would often prioritize lists, scheduling, and intensive planning. With Sam's flexibility as a video editor, Hamza would be able to adapt to difficult circumstances and situations as they came through, and seek new solutions. And through Sam employing the same knowledge and tactics that Hamza handed down to him, he could use his own contrary instincts to contribute to the mission of spreading self-improvement videos, on the basis of the same information. To make this simpler to understand, let's imagine that through editing Hamza's early videos, Sam got himself acquainted with much of the cult literature of the movement, as likely was the case. Through reading the same books Hamza did with a contrary perspective, Sam could come up with all the possible disagreements viewers of the channel could have with the messaging of the content. If the decision were between publishing a long book summary or a short one, the two could discuss the possible ramifications of this choice and settle upon a decision. This decision would result in a higher or lower amount of views, and the two would react appropriately, with Sam trying to adapt to the situation and Hamza outlining their mistakes in the decision-making process. Rinse and repeat, and the two were able to mend their differences into a collaborative process that increased the chances of YouTube success and online growth. We can also see that Hamza's own will to expand the community was also imported on Sam. It was not long after the aesthetic body guide led to an expansion of long-form videos on Hamza's channel that he began considering compiling his community into a large group. This was done mostly with the use of his previously mentioned platforms of Discord and Instagram, both of which Sam was himself knowledgeable on. Sam was therefore instrumental in the idea-making process of the Discord server, its initial setup and moderation, working remotely to help ensure that the community ran smoothly. The other platform, Instagram, would evolve in relation to Hamza's movement in a variety of ways, in an understandable love-hate relationship. Hamza and Sam would both have to brainstorm one of the most difficult challenges of leading the movement, in a paradox of hypocrisy of a crusade against social media. This decision-making process would take many twists and evolve over a large chunk of time, as Hamza would attempt to better understand how he could use Instagram for the benefit of his audience. It was undoubtedly a confusing choice to make. The people who most needed to hear the message of self-improvement were concentrating on huge, mainstream social media platforms like Snapchat, Instagram, and TikTok, which Hamza himself had abstained from on what he called a dopamine detox. These initial dopamine detox guys are what led to much success for the channel around the aesthetic body course era, and it seemed somewhat uncanny to spread the message for Instagram, which itself was the leading factor for the rise of depressive episodes in young men, and perhaps one of the most mentally damaging platforms available. Sam was likely helpful in considering the expansion of the movement. Where we can assume Hamza most likely looked to his principles and what would portray true self and essence to his audience, Sam could have seen opportunity for growth. 
around the 5,000 subscriber mark of the channel and the linking of Hamza's first Instagram account, Hamza97, to the community, the crossing point could indicate that Harbinator's input was essential to setting the trend for exponential growth. By combining Hamza's personal life story with the issues faced by the commentators, or the boys as he would refer them. For using social media to spread his message while simultaneously crusading against it, Hamza found out he could embody a savior figure, coming into the depths of the darkness to pull people out, rather than a YouTuber playing both sides to win. This soon became one of the purposes of the Discord server, perhaps an innovative idea for a community of young men who did not play video games, connected for a website and app dedicated to gamers solely. By providing this safe haven and launching his Discord server, appropriately entitled Hamza's Cult, young men who otherwise would have went to gaming communities for companionship could find a place of mutual advice and understanding about fitness, business, and self-improvement, now quickly becoming the motto of Hamza's channel. This form of self-improvement became embodied for a single phrase. Do the hard work, especially when you don't feel like it. The origins of this phrase are not clear, but can be traced back to a few older videos where Hamza encouraged the essential practice he viewed as the core to a self-improving male lifestyle. When faced with resistance, Hamza encouraged his viewers to perceive it as a challenge to make themselves uncomfortable. From psychologically conditioning themselves to handle discomfort and even chase after it in difficult times, these viewers would better prepare themselves for difficult situations to come. With the doctrine of doing the hard work in mind, viewers congregated onto the Discord community, where they would await Hamza's new uploads. The simplification of the usual Discord server model and mild moderation inspired also the revamping of Sam's own community for its livestream content, Harbor Hotel. Sam's community would serve in conjunction with Hamza's cult as a place for self-improvement bros to assemble and give one another advice, but it was a slightly more moderate and more community-based incantation of this idea, creating a Harbinator sub-community within Hamza's cult. These sub-communities soon became commonplace as Hamza's content began spreading across the internet with Sam's advice. Worthwhile to mention are the attempts of community veteran and moderator Agro7 to create a similar channel with a decent following, as well as a global hub, where self-improvement communities targeted at specific localities could be found. Another honorable mention could be Maros Community, formed by an Israeli self-improvement YouTuber going by that name, seeking to reach out to men already on a path of abstinence, celibacy, and a drive towards business and physical fitness, and helping them readjust fully to this lifestyle. Maros Community, although totally separate from the Hamza server and largely invite-only, quickly also became one of the largest larger self-improvement spaces on Discord, developing a more filtered and mature following than most of its predecessors. It was circumstances like these that could have made Hamza realize his model could be replicated, and as his channel grew, he advised for other ambitious YouTubers to assist him in spreading this message, by creating their own subgenres of the community specializing in topics such as fitness, mindfulness, and meditation, as well as nofap, or simply abstinence from masturbation for those unacquainted with the term. Such topics became the most frequent requests for videos on Hamza's channel, along with the frequently requested theme of videos pertaining to dating advice and young men dealing with women, which soon became the most common type of content published by Hamza. It is around this time that the outsourced videos began hooking viewers in with the image of two characters, as separate as can be. A character by the name of Jeffrey, or a caricature of a depressed Wojak meant to encapsulate the essence of modern man, would be mocked at the beginning of each video for his failed attempts at following through self-improvement doctrine. Hamza's editors would then create short videos commending a separate fictional character, or Adonis, using the meme image of Giga Chad, a powerful stoic weightlifter who outranked Jeffrey in every area, and would attempt to find a conceivable way to help him. Using the hook of a drastic comparison between these two made-up characters, Hamza could entertain viewers, particularly teenage guys, with the promise of a narrative, which he could then follow up with practical advice for fixing a particular area of life. This model was easily replicable. Video on how to talk to girls? Jeffrey can't talk to girls. Adonis is excellent at it. Adonis is helping Jeffrey become more like Adonis. Here's how you can be more like Adonis. Lay off alcohol? Adonis doesn't need alcohol. The adult call needs him, but Adonis refuses. Get off Tinder? Adonis has never used Tinder. Abstain from social media? Adonis doesn't know what social media is. Race testosterone? Adonis is made of testosterone. You get the point. While one could argue a formula like this is repetitive, it must be important to understand that some degree of reliability and formulaic adaptability must be expected in all business models. No matter the McDonald's, for example, there will always be a burger you can buy into. In every game of Hoy Ford, there's a wacky civil war in Spain. If you go into a DMV in the US, there will always be an American flag outside. Likewise, Hamza and Sam quickly figured out that a video on Hamza's channel could be sooner recognized and more easily remembered by the audience if each new production began with a short, tiny 30-second clip comparing the struggles of Jeffrey and the successes of Adonis. As Hamza would later put on a podcast, the idea was to give young men a figure of some sort to live up to, a model which he himself couldn't fit into while remaining fully authentic. 
The idea of a Pakistani British 25 year old with several years of experience of weightlifting positioning himself as a master of all trades would seem absurd to many. And Hamza knew this. He was a man just like any other and admitted openly to his audience that he had various areas of growth to improve himself on personally. While openly admitting and proudly stating that he remained ahead of the vast majority of men in his community, he admitted that, particularly in the face of other creators like Iman and Chris from First Men, he still had a lot to learn. Hamza's channel had only recently begun growing, and it would soon become apparent that the focus of these new Jeffrey vs. Adonis videos would need to be on the repetition of information obstructed by modernity that young, poor, and untrained men still needed to hear, to bring them along on a journey of self-improvement along with Hamza. Hamza would then attempt to keep his fans by his side, hosting frequent meetups, Discord lectures and calls, as the idea of coaching calls became much more difficult time-wise. This allowed for a situation where fans of his channel and members of the cult community would not only feel like they were following Hamza, but rather joining him on a self-improvement journey to become this idea of Adonis, or what David Dita would call the superior man. This strive towards being a better person cannot be better represented by anyone than Sam, who admitted on his own channel to having grown up in a difficult household and having to pull himself up by the bootstraps, a uniquely American story for a British guy. Through his time as a live streamer of a small audience attempting to entertain a small and close-knit circle from his Discord server while narrating over games each day of the week, Sam had little to learn except the lesson he had already had to face. The lesson of resilience from suffering. His early lack of success in live streaming and content creation taught the introverted Sam Harbone how to better engage with an audience and make business decisions, a rough course of many years of personal experience that would only come to fruition once he had an outlet in the form of the newly formed self-improvement community. It is here, the new mutual growth and understanding between himself and his now close friend Hamza, that Sam could test his skills and come face to face with his greatest struggle, the general lack of experience. Prior to meeting Hamza, Sam had admitted to never flying out of the country or going on vacation. He now had the shared vision of Hamza's Thailand trip and would need to weigh his excitement with his own fear of flying out the nest, quite literally. As the community viewership and profits grew, Sam found himself slightly alienated among the crowd of weightlifters and amateur entrepreneurs which Hamza had now attracted. For prior to this moment, he had never held a gym membership and found himself struggling with the all too common and relatable burden of social anxiety which I'm sure we all have dealt with in one way or another. It is an immense weight for a man attempting everything he can to make something of himself online to learn that he holds little real skills in the real world. And had Sam not finally found this opportunity to grow as a man in a circle of other men, he likely would have given up and retired to the depressing ways of the modern working world as we speak, a story far too common than it needs to be. With this, we can begin to understand Hamza's story. But God rewards those who seek his mercy, those who have the spirit, drive, and determination to keep on moving forward in the face of challenges. God and faith rewards those who do the hard work, especially when they don't feel like it. And when the universe remains giving, the human spirit learns to give in. And even inside of the most mediocre of us, a warrior can be found, a reflection of the man nature wanted us to be. As Hamza found success after having reinvented himself, Sam would begin his own journey, uncovering a layer of purpose not as a sidekick to a popular YouTube channel, but as a man finally given the opportunity to learn from a community and prove his worth to the world. As this documentary is being made, Sam Urbone has switched over entirely from the gaming genre where his content failed into a genre of lifestyle advice, where his higher quality, less frequent videos have gained an enormous amount of traction. Harbor Hotel recently celebrated 10,000 subscribers on the Harbinator channel, whose live streams were once empty and barren of viewers. For the years of uploading content, Hamza's message adapted, changed, and attempted to fit into the specific themes of the period into which it was cast. As frequently admitted by Hamza himself, along with the team that helped him make his early content, there was a pattern the young content creator would follow that set him apart from the rest he would go through so-called stages. These stages would determine the current focus of the channel. When Hamza was focused on his physical fitness for several weeks at a time, he would put around half his energy towards making videos regarding physical training when he was not at the gym. As his enthusiasm towards martial arts was renewed around the 10,000 subscriber mark, Hamza began producing content talking about just this, in harmony with other videos describing his goals and a refinement of a personal purpose that would constantly face trials and tribulations. One of Hamza's more prominent revolutions was that of the dietary and bodybuilding advice he gave in his videos. In earnesty to his audience, the earliest of his advice videos have not been taken down and are freely available to view, although Hamza himself has reflected on these opinions and admitted to no longer agreeing with them. 
I've been bodybuilding for five years, I'd say that I'm in pretty good shape. So how have I been eating so much junk food and been able to grow or at least maintain a aesthetic body is using the simple formula, calories in versus calories out. So energy in, energy out, it's just physics. It's the only thing you need to know in terms of gaining or losing weight. So I've been doing bulks and cuts, so which means I've been weightlifting and then doing a bulk, which is getting my calories slightly higher, so about 200, 300 more than I need gaining about half a pound a week and which makes muscle and uh, fat and then eventually cutting which just loses fat and tries to maintain muscle. Now I've been doing both bolts and cuts eating just junk food. A video from early 2021 for example advises viewers that through keeping calories in and calories out and following a dietary plan that would fit a person's macros they could still participate in effective bodybuilding. In layman's terms Hamza was advising the practice of dirty bulking where one could still effectively eat sugar, junk food, and other less nutritious meals without killing their gains. In reflection, Hamza compared them to the advice of countless other fitness influencers that first ingrained these beliefs in him when he started out making content. Building an attractive physique means to resistance train, that is weightlifting. This makes muscles while focusing on a progressive overload. So that literally just means making progress as you go along, using heavier weights, doing more reps, longer workouts. The usual guides you'll see online will have you lifting heavy three times a week, focusing on compound movements. The upper four pack is generally built quite well through a normal weightlifting program, but the lower set underdeveloped and that's the one that really fine tunes the physique to make it look more attractive. Hamza's aesthetic body guide put a newly defragmented perspective onto commonly held beliefs about bodybuilding, weightlifting, and the concept of a progressive overload. Although the information in the guide was not exactly new, it was not widely and straightforwardly discussed in terms of YouTube, allowing his previously mentioned video to reach new heights. Many of the early videos would continue to be experimental in nature, showing Hamza briefly discussing various topics, from mid-workout injuries to specific types of pains to experimenting with calisthenics and bodyweight exercises in the forest where he trained during his isolation period prior to starting the channel. Such videos later gathered traction as Hamza's long-form content accumulated attention, allowing viewers to get a better idea of who the person behind the camera was, in conjunction with the journey for a more authentic persona. I think my generation has always had some kind of fear of doing nothing. We've been raised to work incredibly hard, told to always stay busy in case the boss might be walking past and see your work ethic and maybe he'll decide to promote you. So now we never set aside time to do nothing. We're always doing something. If we're not working, we're scrolling. If we're not scrolling, we're watching. If we're not watching, we're sleeping. But what about thinking? It's strange that we don't allow ourselves to think properly. We place our thoughts on the backdrop behind the screen that we're currently looking at. Our minds will be non-stop thinking about something and we'll be covering that with a movie or Sarah's Instagram post where she's now happily married to the love of her life. Hamza's attention would soon shift in one of these stages from physical fitness to mindfulness. Although his mental health practice was factually limited to several coaching clients through Discord and a pity issued university degree in clinical psychology, Hamza still attempted to educate himself on the practices of mindfulness through books like The Oxygen Deficit, exemplified in Hamza's numerous videos about proper breathing and meditation techniques. Early videos took a turn by creating the full-on mentality that Hamza would later adopt in attempting to guide his viewers away from instant gratification activities. The advice of staring at a wall in order to formulate one's thoughts more properly came into play here. 
And Hamza became a big advocate of gratitude journaling, a practice where he himself admitted he found himself often struggling with while attempting to maintain a busy schedule. Hamza's focus on gratitude journaling and lining out life goals eventually helped him get a clearer idea of plans for the channel and the months ahead, something he only could have reasoned himself into. It was around this time that the full-on mentality switched from being a defining aspect of Hamza's content during a content stage to being a recurring theme of the channel. To illustrate what I mean, Hamza's videos never truly advised playing video games in moderation. In early videos, he would often refer to gaming as a time-wasting pursuit, but never seemed too agitated about it. As Hamza's videos began becoming more personal, and the man behind the camera began telling his own story, he became eager to draw lessons and conclusions from these situations, as his therapeutic and supportive personality type would urge him to do. There was no point in sitting down and filming a video, after all, if nothing was to be learned from it. It was at this point that Hamza began advising against instant gratification entirely, and embarked on a crusade against distracting habits that would define self-improvement, which was ceasing to simply be a term to define self-help for men, and began drawing out into a full ideology alike to interpersonal transcendence. Have you ever had long periods of having thoughts, whether they're negative or they just feel pointless about things that aren't exactly helpful? Like, I should have said that in the argument, about an argument that happened years ago. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to reduce stress and negative thoughts so that your mind feels a bit more friendly. I've been there in that deep end where my mind and my thoughts felt like a bully inside of my head, inescapable. I don't know why exactly this happens, but I do know how to stop it or at least reduce it. So if you're still here, by the end of the video, you'll have a practical technique that you can start doing right away that will definitely help reduce stress and negative thoughts. If self-improvement was Buddhism, simply put, then Hamza considered himself to be the Buddha and his viewers would soon follow suit. Nothing was a better illustration of this in these early videos on meditation, where he would often take an authoritative stance against the distracting impulses of modern society and social media, venting against concepts as well as the shade of red on a phone notification bar. If the boys were to advance beyond their current stage of sitting on their asses playing Minecraft on Discord, then totality would have to be invoked. At this mark of his channel, Hamza began to understand the ramifications of just this concept. I'm a failure. I fail all the time. And I love failing. Do you know how many PR attempts I failed? How many business ideas I tried and failed? How many diets I went on? How many times I tried to stop binge eating? I failed more times than the lazy version of me has even tried. I even tried to be a rapper at one point. Who gonna have my back? I'm out here by myself. Yeah. <laughs> I tried learning to code, I tried joining the Air Force, I technically failed in university. I tried game developing, I made my own little PC game when I was 14 years old. I tried to become a writer, a dropshipper, a fitness influencer. I tried and gave up many different sports and habits. Hamza's video soon took a more honest and emotional outlook as he directly addressed the subjects of his own thoughts and the fears of his past self. As more of an audience accumulated around Hamza and the British content creator began seeing that his influence extended greatly over the men who were like his past self, just as intended, he aimed to pretend that the camera was indeed a younger version of himself. And reflecting before a video, it is clear in Hamza's eyes and demeanor that he aimed to speak not towards an audience, but towards a person, a specific person, balancing the authentic history of reference he thus far developed. From the moment of birth, you're told that men don't cry. Don't cry again. I'll give you something to cry about. Don't worry, men cry. He's crying, what a pussy. You've grown up with an unspoken disadvantage. The education system is against you. Masculine traits are punished. Sit still and read through this book. You were fighting at lunchtime, we're gonna call your parents and they're gonna beat your ass because you thought it was okay to act like a boy around here. You battle huge double standards every day. Men should respect women's bodies. He's got a small penis. Don't be sexist. You earn more money than women. Who cares if you work longer hours in undesirable jobs and you're more likely to die in those jobs? There is a wage gap. If she accused you, then it must be true. Why would she lie? Girls don't lie. You are guilty until proven innocent. Phrases like, hey guys, or hey everyone, do not occur at all in Hamza's videos. There's not a single one of them. As more young men began clicking on these videos, they found it shocking how easy the message was to relate to, and for one simple reason. 
When you found a video from Hamza Ahmed on your YouTube homepage, a part of you could not help but feel that the video was made for you specifically. It also became clear pretty quickly that Hamza's message began to have a toll on him personally. In older videos, you can see memorabilia of video games Hamza allotted a lot of his time to playing. In his videos, he had frequently mentioned his childhood obsession with RuneScape, along with Minecraft and League of Legends, the latter of which remained a poster on his wall. In a later video, however, this poster was replaced with a lined sheet of paper reading along the lines of complete focus in paper. As environments in different locations circulated around him, the full weight of responsibility that comes with desiring to be a role model surely bit into early Hamza. And then came the cult. I've created a cult. This is my plan with full honesty. Now, stage one, you may be here. So stage one is the self-improvement struggle. Stage two is where it starts to work. You know, you struggled at first, you were unable to get just about into it for whatever reason. At this stage, in stage two, you've changed a few things and it actually starts to work. Stage three is beautiful. This is what I call flow. At stage three, in this point of flow, you're in the flow of things. You still do get up and out, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, but it's a lot more flatlined. And actually now you're able to see that it's more like this, where you can actually start to see, because you've been onto it for long enough, you can actually start to see that you've made pretty good progress. You can see where you started, you can see where you've ended up. Stage four, I think you guys already know what this is. Stage four, self-actualization. So what's happened is stage three, you were in the flow of things, you had the exact plan, you were just following it for months, years, weeks, who knows, depending on your specific situation. Eventually you reach the point of self-actualization. The religious venerance that came along with the mission of improving his viewers' lives expanded Hamza beyond the horizon of self-focus and mere plans to travel. Old circumstances were quickly abandoned as the zeal with which the community demanded new plans for growth and expansion began to overtake the Hamza channel. With the start of the Discord server and the combined attempts of Hamza and Sam to expand the self-improvement movement beyond just themselves, more young men began not only coming in, but seeking to replicate the early successes of the two. The early vision of becoming a digital nomad was becoming closer and closer to a reality for Hamza Ahmed, as he no longer viewed himself as a person constrained by boundaries. His message had now been broadcast around the world, and the channel readied for a new stage. With Sam's help and the growing profit from the rising liability of holding one-to-one -one coaching calls and numerous online courses for Skillshare, the channel had enough funds to arrive at the next stage. At this time, Hamza had moved back from a small apartment he had inhabited after college with his at-the-time girlfriend to his parents' home to allow himself to better focus on making content. Step zero, improve your mental health. Step one, level up your discipline and your willpower by setting a routine and sticking to it as best as you can and also keeping your cravings like a sweet in front of you to test and level up your willpower without caving in. Discipline. Discipline is the skill of doing the hard work, especially when you don't feel like it. And it is so utterly important in this modern day. You cannot be like the average men who do the things that they feel like doing. So I remember being 16, 17, 18 years old and like desperately wanting and I'm searching online, pick up artist videos, red pill posts and I wish someone asked me this question when I was in that stage. Would you penetrate yourself? Dumbass. The rest of your day is going to be less productive even though you've technically got more hours but it was never more hours of the day that you actually wanted. I actually want to go to Ohio. It's a very common thing now to see boys who have been raised without their dads, their father figures. I'm very privileged to have a strong father who has incredible masculine virtues of, of providing for his family. I've always had that. Surrounded by the same walls of his childhood bedroom that now constrained him, Hamza sees the opportunity in letting the digital environment around him assist him rather than detriment him. My little brother, who's 14 years old, listens to a lot of red pill content and his main source of the red pill has been watching this YouTuber called Hamza. Good man. By utilizing the ability to connect with his editors and his community to propel his content and actively engaging with men who were part of the movement, Hamza no longer was bound only by self-expectations and could get a clear, actual picture of what his community needed. Jeffrey does not do a front double bicep when Hamza's video comes on. Then the new videos came in. For opening up job applications forms for the Discord server and encouraging talented young men to apply for work for him and Sam, Hamza was quickly able to gather a team of several editors who would assist him in keeping a more concrete upload schedule, adding effects to his videos while still keeping them in high in definition and quality. Hiring men who already knew what they were doing ensured that Hamza was able to get a consistent increase in viewership and broadcast himself to the general public in brighter lights. 
The full mobilization of both his previously personal Instagram account, on which Hamza had unfollowed all to whom he had not spoken in some time, as well as the Discord server rapidly growing and now structured into a group of units in a ranking system, assisted the movement in acquiring new traction. Men would come from the channel to Hamza's Instagram messages to seek personal advice, giving him new ideas for videos. In the Discord server, users gradually moved from general text chats pertaining to accountability and personalized advice to the voice chats, where they discussed various topics of personal importance, allowing the server to become more active as a result. The ranking system created by Sam, administrator Sean in Agro7 was also assisting in this. The old Discord server model, the first one that community used, was based on the notion of shifting and admitting all newly inducted users into the role of initiates, with a Jeffrey role reserved for the band and or muted, and roles users could ascend to. After initiates came the disciples, and soon the role of acolyte was admitted as an intermediary. The disciples would gather once a month to nominate Adonises in a voice chat, and certain Adonises could become Maximuses through long-term contributions to the community. Such a model encouraged activity, community engagement, and more importantly, traction to the channel. As programmers and developers gathered around Hamza's freshly assembled team of editors for the start of 2022, it was clear he set forward big ambitions for not only the direction of the channel and the content within it, as evidenced by unfiltered videos published around this time, but for his own life. A new chapter was ready. After much deliberation in his first travel to Dubai, broadcasted over Instagram Live and Discord server as a rare break from normality, Hamza truly began to understand what it was that made his movement unique. The aspiration to be a digital nomad that led him towards personal earnings from e-commerce, through methods like dropshipping and an eBay selling, were still after all what began the movement. As he would later admit on a variety of podcasts and through collaborations with other creators, Hamza knew well that it was his zeal for financial and location independence that started the channel. Could it be that the will to break out from the common alley of the UK, from the crimes in the filthy cold weather streets, was the general drive that made Hamza distinct from other creators? It was at this point that Hamza had met up with Harbinator or Sam several times in person, often finding himself in conflict with his old personal friends and jumping between relationships. The employee-employer bond appears to have been broken entirely around this time, as the typical extrovert and introvert in Hamza and Sam respectively found themselves in complacent as driving forces in the movement. It is Sam whose advice Hamza sought on the long-anticipated journey to Thailand, which was not without preparations. In Dubai, Hamza had finally become acquainted with Iman Gatsi, one of the first statistical rivals and simultaneous role models in content creation. Through meeting Iman for the first time, the self-improvement Messiah first understood the true extent of his role. The early Hamza, in his meditative and spiritual stage, warned much about the incredibility of ego and the dangerous power that it held. But as much as he attempted to restrain himself in the face of both positive feedback and backlash-like criticism, it was undeniable that Hamza's movement left a mark upon the world. Otherwise, he would not be here. In commemoration of this, Hamza's team met up in Amsterdam to celebrate. And it was here where he began forming plans for working out a plan to create content around his travels which by now had changed from filming B-roll footage on a morning bus commute to work through industrial Britain to first-class jet flights to the Middle East. Hamza saw ample opportunity in the production of various courses and undertook the controversial step to pause his coaching calls entirely, offering only the occasional exception of personal, extended consultations with the wealthy and entrepreneurship who could truly benefit from his advice and guidance in the ever-changing online world, which Hamza had himself recently began lecturing and sharing experiences on and even more newly developed courses. This, however, was not to stick either. We can safely assume, although have no way of knowing for sure, that a part of the man felt slightly unwell of the idea of distributing advice to those who had enough resources to seek it in someone else. Hans admitted that he had much to pay back his fans with. In addition to broadening the scope for job applications and allowing even more members to the team, complete with long-form editors, TikTok and Instagram Reels editors, outsourcers, content publishers, thumbnail artists, and even strategists, Hamza would remain open about his collaboration with other talented young men on his team, and later encouraged them to do the same. At the same time, matters became complicated in the middle of Hamza's solitary YouTube drama episode, with another large content creator by the name of Sneeko. Bro, I think you're all a little gay for liking this. Hamza! 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 Y'all need some friends, bro! This is crazy. Don't manage to do this. All of his videos are like, every day you have to improve. He's a gym bro who can speak eloquently. What the fuck do you watch, chat? Get- grow the fuck up, bro. Do you not have friends? You don't have friends, do you? All of you are just 18-year-old and lonely, bro. 
I thought me and Sneeko were cool. I have him on WhatsApp and I've connected really, really well with his brother who we'll speak about soon. And before we continue on with this video, I really just want to say like, I love Sneeko's old videos. I love his old vibe. I just think that he might've went down the wrong path. It is at this point, somewhere around the planning stage of the Thailand trip, that Hamso's paths intertwined with associates of none other than Andrew and Tristan Tate. Sneeko is simultaneously one of the least and most recognizable names in the self-improvement community. And is more often associated with the fringe side of YouTube. I could not draw a better comparison for Sneeko than by contrasting him with the 2015 to 2016 YouTube superstar Leafy is here, who made controversial and harsh commentary videos surrounding various topics, until leaving and being welcomed back with a ban. Sneeko's story in retrospect is not much different. Hamza had gotten acquainted with Sneeko's general editing style where researching for his own content early on in his career, and soon began getting hooked on the well-edited long-form essays early Sneeko posted onto his channel, just like this one. He would combine the video essay format with the likeliness of a rant, entertaining viewers while informing them on topics like masculinity and the downfall of traditional values. Sneeko, even at the time, appeared far more divisive and political than Hamza, but it only made him more entertaining to watch, especially on live streams. It was as Sneeko began live streaming, though, that a darker side of him began to come out, and his often aggressive stances towards various guests on his streams and persons he criticized both propelled him into a fame and disenfranchised his old audience. While over a million new subscribers began surrounding Sneeko with praise, particularly enjoying his reaction to the rise of the Tate brothers over social media platforms like TikTok, Hamza was left as part of the disenfranchised group. If you consider what you've learned about Hamza thus far, and what you know of his online history yourself, it is not difficult to see why. From the beginning of his channel, Hamza put much value into authenticity, and he undoubtedly saw the potential of the rise of the Tate brothers, especially Andrew Tate. As Andrew Tate became the most Google man on the planet and advised young men to better themselves in much the same way, Hamza felt himself outcompeted in a harsh call to reality that could not be compared to anything aside from a David Goggins-esque resurrectional speech to spirit, Although much more vulgar, Tate's clips woke up young men to the reality of the world's harshness, and his outlandish takes allowed him to gain traction over social media, dividing audiences through controversy. Although Hamza would not follow the same path, he took careful notice of the strategies Andrew Tate used to elevate himself, and the points that he made. It was clear, at the very least, that Tate knew how to make money, although Hamza realized it was a better bet to play it safe. Sneeko did not. Their paths as content creators diverged here. Sneeko's disenfranchisement with Hamza was preceded by his anxious discovery of the rising content creator that was once merely a fan. Sneeko's video documentary style had soon completely changed into live streams and live stream clips, and his age-old YouTube channel began getting filled with numerous live stream clips of Sneeko reacting to various types of content, while reflecting on his own experiences in life. As Sneeko and Hamza's audiences became more intertwined on their Andrew Tate's rising social media influence, and the topic of defining masculinity and de indeed defining masculine purpose inevitably came about, the two were bound to interconnect in one way or another. Sadly for Hamza, this interconnection was fierce at first. Sneeko became openly critical of Hamza's content on stream. This undoubtedly led Hamza Discord members to ask if he would formulate a response. And as if Joseph Stalin at the outbreak of Invasion Barbarossa, at first Hamza stayed quiet. But after several days, just like this, many became convinced that Hamza would not answer to Sneeko. And yet, on a fateful day not long after Hamza's team of reorganization, he would formulate a response in which he would praise Sneeko's channel, growth of recent success, while simultaneously depicting a form of fatherly worry for Sneeko's declining moral state and aggressive behavior. Rather than lashing back out at Sneeko as he would have expected, Hamza played the genuine role of a guiding mentor, as he did for many of his fans, which seems to have tripled Sneeko's respect for him live on stream for the aspiring YouTuber. Sneeko, who at the time had a larger channel, was undoubtedly convinced that Hamza did not struggle to give practical advice, and only aspired for fame just like many YouTubers around him. After becoming acquainted with Hamza's community for backlash that seemed less alike of ridicule and more in line with a worried guidance, Sneeko finally relented and offered Hamza an opportunity to quote-unquote squash the beef live on stream by reaching out to him over Discord. Hamza gladly accepted, and the two men hosted a Scream collaboration, clips of which later went viral, leading to more reconciliation between the two. While Sneeko would be suspended from YouTube shortly after for previously made controversial statements, an influence that would be perceived by the platform to have been largely negative, it seemed to much of his audience that he attained an aura of calmness after halting the drama of Hamza and adjusting to his more stoic, detached ways. For becoming acquaintances and later online friends with Hamza, Sneeko learned to better control himself on stream, and was able to offer Hamza valuable advice on streaming himself, as Hamza began streaming to his unfiltered channel around the time of his long-anticipated Thailand trip. It was also at this point that Hamza first dealt with the decision to either reject Andrew Tate's messaging or ride along the wave of exponential fame that it brought about, slightly cheating Hamza out of a chance in the spotlight. He would ultimately take the middle route, 
much like with his use of social media, acknowledging both the positive and negative qualities of Tate's influence, and soon leading to a shout-out on Andrew Tate's Twitter account. While Hamza would later spend much of his time in Dubai, seeing his time in the UK as volatile and unwarranted, he found himself frustrated at the fact that Tate had been so difficult to reach. It became apparent to many that while Hamza's influence did not extend nearly as much as Tate's in modern day, the two still both played a considerable role in the minds of their young male audiences, and a collaboration between the two could have proved fruitful, just as it did with Tate and Sneeko. However, as Sneeko would apparently be dragged along as help on the Kanye 2024 presidential campaign after his ban and moved on to Rumble, new futures awaited for Hamza as well. It is impossible to end off this segment of the script without first mentioning Hamza's controversial relationship with Instagram. Hamza frequently used the platform through his old personal account, Hamza97x, to send messages out to his fans and update them on his content creation production process, as well as share other content he and his audience had an interest in. This is not to last, however, as Hamza's efforts against the negative mental effects of social media culminated in a long-winded rant entitled Delete Instagram Now, published on July the 18th of 2022, and closely followed by a similarly formatted long-form video named Delete TikTok Now on July the 27th. These two videos had been the final straw in a long-winded battle between Hamza and what he perceived as the most harmful aspects of modern society, social media. In what could be considered his rawest and most impactful video yet, Hamza began Delete Instagram Now by discussing the harmful side effects of social media addiction, but also the drawbacks of using social media to communicate in general. He expounded upon how even a slight decrease in mental health on a worldwide scale could lead to major repercussions and butterfly into the collapse of certain ideals held dear by Western societies, citing examples such as sharp decreases in attention span in children and the average employed adult's inability to focus on work. Hamza argued that situations like these resulted from tiny habits the average man engaged in, combined with the human need to connect and enter a web of social pressures in situations that is not physical, but rather digital. The simple claim made by the video is that the average person's life would not be improved by having an account on Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, or any other social networking service, and that it was far better to utilize this time by spending it on bettering one's physique, learning interesting and profitable skills, meditating, and better connecting with one's peer group outside of the social media culture, preferably with people who aren't chronically online as well. Hamza's audience, many of which took this critical attitude towards video games in the past at the insistence of the previously talked about all-in motive, were ready to fall through. Just a day after Hamza posted delete Instagram now, thousands of men who previously followed him on the platform purged their accounts and deleted the app from their phones, encouraged by the support of other viewers in the comment section and Discord community. The audience unplugged. Several days later, Instagram falsely deleted Hamza's account of 70,000 followers, claiming that he had violated the terms of service. Despite no new posts having been made on the account since Hamza's raw 40-minute rant on YouTube, confused fans took to the comments section and Discord server and community tab to ask whether Hamza had deleted his account too or was banned from the platform. Soon, the truth came to light. As Hamza logged onto his account on desktop to ask his barber for a phone number and found himself removed, facing a message announcing his permanent removal from the platform. The late Instagram now faced a sequel, I am banned on Instagram, an even more powerful rant about the dangers of social media, and the title of the first video was changed to Instagram ban me for this video, propelling the unfiltered analysis of the internet's dangerous impact on culture towards new viewers' homepages. It is difficult to tell when Hamza's journey attained the religious ferocity of a passion project gone off the rails, a mission now to be fulfilled. But if one were to point to a specific time, the several months in preparation for the Thailand trip in early 2022 would be a good starting point. Hamza found himself within a rock's throw at his purpose, to help young men overcome their own struggles. Hamza hadn't settled down with a girl, not yet at least. He continued to be honest with his audience and spoke about the beauty of having crushes and celibacy, abstaining from frequent promiscuous sex and a party boy lifestyle he had thus far led, and waiting for the right one, quote unquote. But no further details were given. In his unfiltered content, Hamza became clear that as his channel grew, he saw it as a responsibility to grow as a masculine superior man and a leader too. Seeking to expand in this direction, he picked up the reading of The Way of the Superior Man and was blown away immediately, sharing his key insights with his predominantly young male audience. A masculine man must have a very feminine woman to polarize him. If he is to succeed, Hamza found this out very quickly. Such a revelation could not come at a better time, though. The plane tickets were already booked, and they were going off to Thailand. No one knew this better than Sam. And yet Hamza would have to not only leave behind his family, including his sister, whom he had employed as a full-time helper in his business, and his older brother, a doctor, but also his old life in the UK. It would be the first time Hamza would have to face this directly, and such a challenge would have to come by parting ways with the girl he had grown closest to while in the UK. Hamza opened up about this to his audience, 
citing that although his interests lied elsewhere, he would not ask a subject of his affections to settle down and wait for him. Hamza's mind was no longer stuffed with League of Legends characters and levels and the college crushes he advised and warned the audience about. His mind was now filled with purpose. With the once distant goal of becoming a digital nomad suddenly his new reality, Hamza's mind rapidly became filled with masculine purpose, his thoughts no longer dwelling in the past. The same could not be true for Sam, but luckily, his newly online famous friend remained by his side to advise him. Flying out so far out of the country seemed ridiculous, but what is better for the soul than leaving the nest? And after all, Providence does reward those who work hard, especially when they don't feel like it. Before his Thai trip, Hamza found himself opening up to the audience about facing many personal burdens. For one, the lessons he took from the way of the superior man were not accepted by one of his best friends, who dismissed the book and Hamza's content as misogynistic in nature, and severed ties between the two. Hamza opened up about this on his unfiltered channel, claiming that while losing friends was a natural part of the self-development process, he could not help but pity those who would often abandon others in such an immature manner, rather than lift them up entirely. These new unfiltered videos, filmed from his parents' home just before the Thai flight, both attempted to dis dissect the reasons why the movement didn't gain ground sooner, and try to delve into the deeper insecurities that held many men back from achieving their own purpose. Just before embarking on the trip, Hamza encouraged viewers to start their own self-improvement channels, quit watching his videos, and even criticize his content in an attempt to appeal to the algorithm. He found that as his own videos gained traction, merely putting his name in the name, tags, and or thumbnail of a video would propel it to new heights, and was therefore desirable for new YouTubers seeking an audience. Although this propelled a wave of community members to start their own channels detailing their self-improvement journeys, and criticizing Hams on certain aspects of his channel while still maintaining a more or less formal tone, it also began a domino effect of content disparaging Hams' views, which seems to have continued to this day. And salmon. Um, excuse me, can I have, um, what fruit juices do you have? Pineapple, please. Oh, actually, same for me, pineapple for me as well. Before this, it was nearly impossible to see the young content creator beyond his own two channels and that of Harbinator. Now he was becoming a sort of online celebrity, receiving the attention of new self-improvement communities around the globe as part of Agro7's global hub, as well as seeing himself placed on personality database, a Wikipedia-like typology site dedicated to cataloging the instincts and inclinations of internet personalities, celebrities, objects, and fictional characters. It took just a few short weeks for Hamza's profile and community discussion board to reach the top of the health, lifestyle, and fitness section, with Harbinator also being placed on the site as a side effect. When Hamza finally departed for Thailand, it was with the hope of not only reaching the initial dream of becoming a financially independent digital nomad, but rediscovering his own purpose through taking a break in content. Around this time, a fellow YouTuber by the name of Jack, who runs a WhatsApp program named the Gorilla Tribe, similar to Hamza's cult, and owns a channel named the CEO of Testosterone, encouraged Hamza to come along and visit him in Thailand. Collaborations were nothing new for Hamza. Even before the Sneeko beef, Hamza found himself hosting a program named the Unfiltered Section Podcast inviting guests such as Harbinator and his dad to come out and speak on various topics. Frequent spars between his community and a Blackpill YouTube channel named Wheat Waffles led to Hamza speaking much about the ideals of his movement while in Thailand, just around this time. Wheat Waffles' channel, standing at around 100,000 subscribers, was briefly Hamza's main competition. In contrast to the British content creators in real life videos, the nameless YouTuber just a couple miles away was more known for face analysis ratings and his service therein, and the statistical implications of a changing dating market. The idea of a blue pill and a red pill originally comes from the 2000s era movie The Matrix, frequently referenced in the likes of Andrew Tate in his online community, although spread through the internet as far back as 2016. In the context of Wheat Waffles' channel, these quote-unquote pills reference the modern dating scene, where taking a blue pill meant living in ignorance of the societal changes impaired upon young men seeking a relationship, and taking the red pill would be accepting the truth of self-improvement and self-mastery, as a necessary step toward attracting the opposite sex, similar to what Hamza advised through his content. Very early on, Wheat Waffles positioned himself and his content as belonging to neither of these, claiming himself to be a sort of advocate of the black pill, or a set of ideas which suggested very little could be done to improve one's looks, which were mostly determined by genetics and early upbringing. This depressing line of thinking did not catch on with Hamza, who invited Wheat Waffles to a fallen debate for Discord, published to his channels months prior before the trip. Despite the two clearly exchanging all their viewpoints and Hamza's apparent stoicism in the argument, many viewers of Wheat Waffles continued coming to Hamza's channel to criticize his views as being too optimistic, leading to a resurfacing of the quote-unquote black pillars in the community around the time of the Thai trip. 
As Hamza took a short break from filming personal content, collaborated with Jack and enjoy Finland, staying in a hotel with Sam and traveling around various parts of the country, particularly interested in various Mai Tai fights, his team found it essential to employ more moderators to assist the Discord community in filtering spam. New active members like Josh28 and a previously mentioned Agro then took it to enforcing new rules for civil discussion, necessary for the new era of the channel as it rapidly began surpassing Wheat Waffles' claim to internet notoriety. As Hamza's silver subscriber plaque was finally ready to be shipped, his main appeal continued to be just the same as it was when he started out, authenticity. Authenticity would come out in its full form in the Thailand trip, as if by prophecy. When Hamza returned from what he described as a life-changing journey, his now highly edited and produced videos took a shift from talking about male self-improvement and gradually began uncovering male-female dynamics as well as the formulation of communities in a modern world. This new interest in sociological implications seemed to have come from somewhere novel. It was clear that the YouTuber now ordained himself bestowed of a clear perspective of his mission and was ready to take on a new step. Two new characters began appearing on the channel around this time, complementing Jeffrey and Adonis with female versions of their instincts, these being Jessica and Anastasia. The latter name seemed distant, foreign, unique almost. Where could it have come from? After several weeks of some inactivity, Hamza came onto the channel to announce that he had little time for posting content after experiencing a change in his life. While on retreat to Thailand, he found a fellow British girl from the north of the UK on break in the same spot, with dreams of becoming financially self-sufficient and being able to lead a life of luxury. Hamza described how overnight he found himself connected to this woman, Anastasia, who seemed to have been put there by something similar to fate and providence. It would take only a few days for Hamza to discover that Anastasia was a long-term admirer of Andrew Tate's podcast, and had a plan of emailing various self-improvement content creators to seek financial advice prior to her own Thai trip. When she opened up the old document, Hamza found his own name and email in the spreadsheet list, to neither of their previous realization. Stunned by the amount of linear coincidences that had happened, Hamza could not help but invite Anastasia back to the UK with no commitment, promising her only a journey of several weeks on boat for Britain, where the two could talk more about their future plans and see whether they were compatible. As the journey came to an end, Hamza finally revealed through his live stream on the Unfiltered channel that he had decided to move in with Anastasia per Sam's advice and blessing. The latter had ascended from the position of a mere video editor to a permanent spiritual mentor, in fact, as was none other than Hamza who baptized Sam in a hotel fountain while on the trip. It was clear then that Harbinator was able to give his blessings and initiate the wedding ceremonies if needed, although no sight of that was there for the moment. Hamza's new relationship gave him a better outlook on living in the UK and his own personal struggles. Lessons learned for the way of the superior man taught him much about feminine and masculine polarization. And how his mission was benefited through having a woman by his side. He felt even more encouraged to see of bad habits after realizing another person depended on him now. But the age-old question came back up, again as Hamza returned to the UK. How would the message be spread to the men who needed it most? As the team speak and with the advice of his best friend and girlfriend, Hamza decided to grow his crew to the maximum amount it would stay at, for permanently opening up job applications to all willing young men for his channel description. At the time, he struggles with problems pertaining to the NHS, or the National Health Service in the UK, refused to offer Hamza a required operation that threatened his fertility. The stress was accumulated by the rising crime rate in Britain, particularly the suburbs of London, where Hamza still resided. Not only that, but his negotiated six-month lease of a £20,000 apartment for him and his girlfriend was cancelled just days before he could move in. It seemed that with an array of new opportunities, new problems arose. Hamza Ahmed took this as a challenge. While on his way to Dubai to gather his funds and paying for a private clinic to take care of the surgery, Hamza encouraged the team and the private viewers to create shorts and replica channels to copy and post his content for better exposure. In his own words, no matter whether he was credited or not, it would eventually lead back to him. Emulating Andrew Tate's own method of attaining online fame, and later being noticed by him and his own PR team for Twitter, Hamza encouraged his viewers to create short channels of him for a prize, and hired more men to his personal team to create accounts all over social media like TikTok, to post his videos in various formats such as shorts. It was around this time that Hamza also created his new Instagram account to better maintain business contacts. While criticized for his move because of a history of negative relations with the platform, it was inevitable. Anyone in a position of online notoriety would be sooner or later compelled to create an outlet of the sort. In the mind of Hamza's team, it was a shame to leave him out of the fold, while influencers promoting negative and outdated nutritional and lifestyle advice remained on the platform. The gambit had worked, and through the moderation of Hamza's team around the time of the surgery, his content spread across social networking platforms, allowing new young men who did not watch YouTube to become fully acquainted with the message. As Hamza left his Airbnb in Dubai, teenagers shouted at him to determine whether he was the sweaty bathrobe guy from TikTok. When he came back to London, at every street corner, young men asked for photos. 
It was clear he had established a base of influence, and Hamza wouldn't let it go to waste. Inspired partially by his newly found interest in competitive Muay Thai fighting while signing up and training for a fight in Thailand, Hamza scheduled a series of meetups at local gym, where his fans could brawl with him. It's pertinent to mention at this point that in between his channel's rise with the Aesthetic Body Guide and the surgery in Dubai, Hamza had very frequently hosted a series of meetups with viewers, most notably in Amsterdam, where the cult met several times. Two of the meetups attaining as much as 100 men eager to converse with one another and their internet idol. These meetups became an inspiration for what would later become Fight Cult, perhaps a play on words on the 1999 movie I previously converted on this channel. With Hamza positioning himself as a Tyler Durden-like super figure, he invited fans to come out into the martial arts gym and spar with him, awakening something new inside of not only his audience, but also himself. At the end of fulfilling a layer of purpose in his fitness and YouTube journey, professional fighting was something Hamza found a true interest in, as he noted on the unfiltered section and realized through both his practices of meditation and gratitude journaling that his channel promoted early on. While the team around the world, with Irv serving as head editor, continued producing high-quality Jeffrey and Adonis animations that would eventually culminate in Hamza reaching the 1 million subscriber mark, it was clear something was off. Hamza found himself living in the UK with difficulty, largely due to renting problems and a previously mentioned crime rate and relocated seemingly permanently to Dubai, entranced by the city's calmness, cleanliness, order, and Islamic religiosity. You've probably seen pictures of these like big buildings before, you've probably seen pictures of Dubai, but you've not had this exact thought that we've been having recently, that this is what a city's supposed to be like. There's not one single piece of rubbish on the floor, bro, I promise you, not one single piece of rubbish we've seen. You know, there was one piece of rubbish, guess what, guess what it was? I accidentally dropped like a receipt or something, I picked back up, I'm like picking it up quick, like I'm not being the only one who's gonna drop rubbish here. However, even Dubai, or Dubia as the unfiltered section would often call it, didn't seem to provide an outlet for climbing a new pyramid. As it became clear that the self-improvement movement was a global force to be reckoned with, Hamza founded himself the leader of his own sub-community in a sea of other sub-communities. Andrew Tate, Tristan Tate, Gerber Johnson, First Man, Masculine Theory, Harbinator, Maurer, Agro, Rob Mueller, and countless others found themselves with their own YouTube channels in small circles, discussing many of the same topics in larger detail. Hamza found that through working the way he did, and limiting himself to four worlds and no new experiences, much of the information he provided in previous videos would be replayed in a circle jerk. Determined to make more of his community, Hamza was frustrated with the practice of daily uploads. They had previously served to inform an entirely unacquainted bunch, and indulgent men about the benefits of delaying gratification, but by now had become generalized with little variation. I completed this layer of my purpose and I'm on to the next layer. I continued things, running the channel, making the videos. I continued things for a while because, you know, there's still a gain to doing this thing, you know. It, it, we're not completely done yet. There's more mental health. There's a bigger channel that we could, you know, create and we could get to five million subs and even more. We could make more money and all this. But the truth is, I genuinely feel like I've completed this layer of my purpose, which was totally fixated on growing the channel and spreading the message of self-improvement to the men out there. I've made the hard decision now after weighing this up so many times after speaking to my close friend who helps me make these decisions, Sam. I've made the hard decision now to stop this content production machine that we had here, this huge team that we had of seven video editors and TikTok guys and sales guys and Twitter guys and we had over a dozen employees who I was personally paying for and I pay my staff very well and I let every single one go including Sam Harbinator, my best friend who's worked for me for over two years. Hamza no longer had the ability to go through the stages of content he had previously relied upon early in the lifetime of his channel, and each topic he covered was depicted more thoroughly by the same YouTube channels he encouraged young men to start early in his career. The YouTube channels inspired by Hamza's content had now grown in size even to rival him, as he himself found tens of thousands of new subscribers a day in a viral covert approach to the likeness of Iman Gazi and Alex Becker, who were formerly just his distant mentors. In a matter of weeks, the former idols now became friends and collaborators for Hamza. And just like that, with the sky seeming the limit, a video was scheduled on Hamza's channel. I fulfilled my purpose. After any semblance of this video was taken down just two hours prior to being published, Hamza issued an apology post in his YouTube channel's community tab, claiming that he needed to filter out his thoughts more before commenting on the topic. Thousands of fans tearfully expressed their confused regret in the possibility of Hamza leaving YouTube entirely, and rallied in curiosity around this new path. 
Just several months before, Hamza expressed great interest in developing a self-improvement content factory by growing his team significantly, and updated his viewers enthusiastically from his hotel in Thailand about the progress of his self-improvement book, which he hoped to release around the early summer of 2023, develop into a worldwide bestseller. What had changed since then? It all soon became clear. The way of the superior man had profoundly affected Hamza's manner of thinking, enshrining the ideas of spiritual masculinity within not only his consciousness, and by following through the guidance of not only his mentors through literature, but his new connections with other creators, Hamza realized his content creation, although insanely popular, had little meaning in comparison of his true calling. Acknowledging his position as a young man able to face mistakes and doubts in several areas of life, Hamza announced to his fans that his new experiences throughout 2022 enabled him to see that the focus of his life would now temporarily shift from martial arts. One of the most interesting recollections just weeks prior to this rapid change, Hamza recalled himself entering a bakery with his girlfriend in the middle of the afternoon, and after being asked if he had the day off work, remarking and realizing to himself he no longer had need to work a day in his life. It could have been in that moment where it occurred to the young content creator, there was a fine line between just work and the finer, more extensive idea of life purpose. That said, Hamza solemnly permified his pertaining decision after seeking his best friend Sam's advice gradually laid off his team with expensive severage packages, testimonials, and recommendations. Eager to allow each editor and helper to build their own careers, as many rapidly began doing after parting ways with the creator. In an end to an era, even Sam found himself no longer working for Hamza, now able to fully focus on his own content on the Harbinator channel. The noise grew quieter. The drip finally stopped. But the overwhelming sense of calm was more than the Hamza cult community ever faced before. It was new, refreshing. A fresh start with a fresh purpose. Hamza quickly altered his YouTube channel banner, previously colorful and eye-catching, to a blank wall of text, simply reading, ignoring the noise. He later released a video of over an hour detailing the reflections of masculine purpose a week later, surpassing the dramatic suspense of Delete Instagram Now. In this video, a snippet of the new content to come, the content creator delved extensively into the details of his own journey, which spanned all the way from a weed addict in a dreadsome apartment working a cult center job, filming his commute as a young man in the UK, to being a fully developed martial arts apprentice fighter and heavy weightlifter, living a digital nomad and location-independent life between Dubai and Thailand. A new life for a new man. Admittedly, it is quite difficult to talk about a topic that you're so involved in and still making it seem somewhat objective. In my view, I delayed the making of this documentary by a great amount. I procrastinated on it for the sole reason that I only wanted to say things that are pertinent to the story. I spent a long amount of time writing and compiling and researching all this information. It took entire weeks to get all of this together in one place so that I could make a full-length video out of it. And it also meant sacrificing my daily and weekly uploads. But the reason I put so much effort into getting this story out there, as you can assume, is because it's something that is near to my heart. I first began watching Hamza's content in early 2021 when he had just a couple thousand subscribers. And being a part of his community, chatting almost daily on the Discord server and being able to talk to people there, as I once admitted in uh, Hamza's comment section, gave me so much of a broader perspective on life, what I was doing and what I wasn't doing. It's even more surprising that I was able to find people in my high school who also similarly enjoyed Hamza's content and various other creators in genres such as First Man or Gerbert Johnson, men trying to better themselves through not only consuming content but also striving to find ways to produce it, to make an income, to build better bodies. And I quickly found myself in a new community that I knew I could always depend on when things went south, which they usually did. Hence, that's the reason I made this channel. I've dedicated almost all of my content to this fight or this struggle against modernity. And what I define as modernity is not being able to sit at home and know that you're safe. It's not the convenience of modernity. It's not the ability to communicate with others instantaneously or get food delivered to your door. The symptoms of these things are really good. They provide us with a more comfortable life. But we do so at the risk of declining mental health, especially in men. And when these issues are not addressed in the mainstream, there form communities around the world that try to combat the repercussions that the modern world has had on 
disenfranchised people like lonely young men. In order to prevent these young men from being radicalized and coming to these fringe groups for advice, it is important to build these strong circles where young men can support one another. And it wasn't necessarily Hamza's content that became more appealing to me, but the fact that I could interact with people in the community. And shortly after becoming acquainted with the YouTube channel and spending several months in the Discord server, I made the effort to create the r slash Hamza subreddit, of which I am, as of the making of this video, still a moderator, and try to check in pretty much daily to make sure that the content quality stays on a somewhat decent level. To clarify, I'm not a neckbeard. I don't often use Reddit. I don't believe that it is a source of, you know, good content. I'm sure we're all aware that there's a lot of degenerate stuff that is out there on Reddit. And similarly, there is a ton of people with degenerate opinions. But just like Hamza's cult became a sort of safe haven on Discord for many, I believe the Reddit community which I had a part in founding can do much the same. And I'm grateful that I was able to contribute at least that much to the movement. Obviously, I don't have a six pack yet, but if you go through my videos, you can clearly see that the production quality has gradually improved. As I've begun trying to order around my own life and become more organized in the stuff that I do, I've also been able to gradually increase the quality of my videos. I've even noticed very small changes, which is the fact that in my early videos, that part of my room would be insanely cluttered and for no planning of my own whenever i sit down here and record everything's just sort of clean i've efficiently managed to clean up my life and while many on youtube claim that watching too many self-improvement videos and diving deep into this rabbit hole is it disadvantageous for them i have found far more benefit in it than if i were to just listen to a tv show of some sort and as I have admitted many times in the past, being just this close-knit member of the community, sort of knowing everyone, affects my judgment when I'm making videos like this, reflecting upon everything. Not only have I spoken to Hamza before regarding the subreddit, but I've also managed to speak to Agro and Maor. I've spoken to Sam on his Discord server on numerous occasions. I've had the benefit of the experience of getting to know all of these people before compiling this video. The aim of this was to compile all the information that me and my team knew and try to craft a grander picture of just how big of a movement this has become. And through compiling a documentary like this, although the script was several thousand words and this admittedly took weeks to edit and produce, and I've definitely sunk some money into getting my editors to help me, has helped me sort of rediscover the purpose of my content. Before this, I was just experimenting. I had no clear idea of where this channel was going. But just as Hamza is admitting that he's departing on the journey of fitness in YouTube, his primary purpose is these past few years, I am just now embarking on this journey of trying to level up my fitness and trying to amass an audience on YouTube. Trying to become a content creator and ensure my own strength and agility are now what I consider my life geared towards and I'm throwing 100% of myself at that purpose. Had it not been for all the literature that was recommended to me in these videos, a lot of it, a lot of it which I have read, I struggle to believe I would have gotten just as far in this journey as I did and would have been able to have been making passive income from home while I'm still in school, which is effectively what I'm doing. Influenced by these videos, I read the four hour work week and listened to an audiobook of The Millionaire Fastlane when I was still getting up at 4 a.m. every morning to get on my school bus to ride around for an hour as the bus picked around other kids. And I would be just sweaty in the back, just crawled up with my little audiobook on my phone, barely any battery because I always forgot to bring the charger, to then go into school and go through classes that I didn't give a shit about. I got done reading the four hour work The Millionaire Fastlane. I outsourced the majority of my video production, I started optimizing the content I had posted across social media. I was able to grow my TikTok pretty exponentially before quitting TikTok for a long while because of how ineffective it was for my mental health. And later get into stuff like e-commerce and crypto, which has sort of supplied me with this extra cash ever since that I've been able to use to pay my editors and help me on this YouTube journey by buying new equipment, such as the lights that you see here. Reading off my phone right now, 4 Hour Work Week, Millionaire Fastlane, 48 Laws of Power, How to Win Friends and Influence People, The Art of War, The Way of the Superior Man, Psychology of Human Behavior, Think and Grow Rich, Atomic Habits, No More Mr. Nice Guy, Meditation. What a shitload of books, dude. I'm just, like, living here with them in my hands at my accessibility. What is this? What am I doing? What is the point? I believe I can illustrate it very clearly. A book in itself, or a video in itself, will not help you. You need to have this internal drive to actually succeed, 
to be able to overcome challenges. A motto like do the hard work, especially when you don't feel like it, is very effective in getting people to understand what the value of discipline, perhaps the most masculine trait there could be, is in the modern world. In the way of the superior man, David Dita posits that idea that a man's masculinity is cyclical, perpetuated by strong men creating good times and weak men creating hard times. We have forsaken discipline in the struggle to recognize for what is pleasurable and what is best for us in the moment. We forgot greatly about the dangers of not staying authentic to ourselves. Movements like these, when they pop up all over YouTube and also other social media, can be a force for good. They are effectively one of the only ways of rewiring our brains and focusing on what truly matters. This documentary is not just about one person. That would be kind of weird. It is about the greater social implications of a guiding mentor who encourages his students to be open with themselves and others just the same way as he is. It's a story that is rebirthed through time. If you think of ancient Roman generals, Jesus Christ and the Twelve Apostles, Buddha and his students, this pattern recurs throughout history. As weak men create a society that falls apart, a new society is built on its foundation. A society that prioritizes ethics and hard work. And when we find ourselves at this point of convergence, in the year 2023, as the old society slowly starts to crumble down and we begin entering a new age, where boys need to become men and rise up above what they previously were, to take on new challenges and responsibilities. Remembering the sacrifices that paved the road for us is a very important thing to do. If there's anything you should take away from this documentary, is that understanding the net total value of how a movement influences people is more important than understanding small details. If Hamza made a video today encouraging people to cut off their own fingers, and a vast majority of those audience decided to cut off their own fingers, if that were to hypothetically somehow happen, his videos and his YouTube career would have still had a positive impact on the world. Much more of a positive impact than a small channel could have. And it wouldn't have happened without the help of not only his team, but the large audience that stuck around to watch the videos and share their feedback. It seems every single time I go onto YouTube, I get recommended videos from around the self-improvement genre. And there are just so many goddamn videos critiquing Hamza and his movement. And every single time it's the same thing. Some pimply faced 20 year old kid that's saying, well, Hams is saying not to play video games at all, but it's fine if you just play one hour of video games. That's not the point. You cannot spread a message by saying, our enemies are bad. If you're trying to get soldiers to fight against an enemy, you must make sure that the enemy is widely understood as evil. You cannot half-ass any battle. And you cannot pull people out of their addictions through saying that the addictions are merely okay. A smoker will not suddenly stop smoking if you tell him that smoking is just a little bad for him. He needs to understand that it is holding him back for him to stop entirely and go cold turkey. Similarly, criticisms are made of the choices that Hamza has made in directing his channel, particularly coming back on social media, or encouraging his viewers to stop watching his videos. But even if a content creator like Hamza went against something that he already said, it would barely have any impact on the people who already took away a positive message from his videos. So in the end, if the message continues to help people, what is the point of getting mad over small details? Whenever you're absorbing content on the internet, the most important thing that you ought to remember is that the total value provided to you by the information or the entertainment that you watch is far more important than the specifics. Because if you go hard in the gym, it doesn't matter if you're doing leg presses or leg extensions, it doesn't matter which muscle group you target, if you work hard enough, you're gonna get results. Do leg extensions though, if you can. I was quite like a, you know, weird, nerdy kind of guy and I had just recently started going to the gym. I started going on some dates with this girl and it felt awesome, you know, she's come out to meet me and like we even held hands one time. The issue was that eventually she probably like lost some interest in me, which is fair enough, but I didn't see the signs. So there would be points, you know, I'd text her like, oh, hey, do you wanna go well, uh, watch Guardians of the Galaxy? No, no, bro, I swear to God, I invited like seven girls to come watch Guardians of the Galaxy with me when it came out. Like, I never even ended up watching. Oh, fuck, that's so sad. I literally invited, like, there was a point when I invited every girl that I would be speaking to to come watch Guardians of the Galaxy to me. And I've not even watched the movie. <laughs> like every fucking girl I invited never came out with me. Man. So Hamza, I have but one very important question.
Would you watch Guardians of the Galaxy with me? Tsukiyo-ni. <laughs>